I'm Michelle Lee, I'm 46 years old. I live in Kellyville in Sydney and I'm going to be Australia's first female to row solo across any ocean. One woman, one rowboat and the Atlantic Ocean. You throw a cork in a washing machine and have a look at what happens to that cork. This is the story of Michelle Lee as she attempts to become the first Australian woman to conquer the world's toughest ocean race, the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. It's the second biggest body of water on the planet. Covering 20% of the Earth's surface, it measures approximately 41 million square miles. It's like the old proverbial, you know, needle in a haystack. It's, you're just a, a, a blot, a, a tiny dot on this vast ocean. Is this woman crazy or is she just an absolute success story waiting to happen? I really dislike being labelled crazy um, because to me crazy is going to attempt something like this with doing zero work. I'm Lisa Goddard and this is Michelle's Story. Michelle's about to start the race where she'll be rowing from La Gomera in the Canary Islands, which is just off Africa, to Antigua in the Caribbean. She could be alone at sea for up to 90 days. Her goal is to make it across the Atlantic in just 55 days, which would also give her a race record. I chatted with Michelle just before she left Australia. Thank you, Michelle, for sitting down with us today. Can you start by introducing yourself and what your goal, what your dream is? Yeah, I'm Michelle Lee, I'm 46 years old. I live in Kellyville in Sydney and I'm going to be Australia's first female to row solo across any ocean. The first question and the most common question I'm sure you get asked, why? Uh, for peace, uh, I read a book and for two years I was played so consistently and persistently that uh, you know this notion to row the ocean just plagued me until eventually one day I thought if I don't do this I'm going to die wondering and there's no good reason for that you know I'm fit I'm able and I just couldn't live with that any longer so I thought I'm going to row the, the Atlantic. <laughs> what was in this book that inspired you? Um, interestingly it is a book of hardship and uh, anything that could have gone wrong did go wrong and the message that I got was every single time she got knocked down, she got back up. Now, she wasn't elite, she wasn't an athlete. Um, she was from the corporate world and she just, you know, threw all of that caution to the wind and said, I'm going to do it. And I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. And I just wanted what she displayed, you know, um, that determination. And yeah, every time she got down, I was like, yeah, you go girl. Like she just, you know, her gas cooker died. So she was eating cold, uh, dehydrated meals. That'd be pretty miserable. By day 20, she was on cold meals. Um, she broke every single oar. Uh, she lost her sat phone communication and uh, she just would not say die. People will say, you're crazy, you're nuts. What are you thinking? What do you say to that? And um, you, you must get that a lot. Oh, all the time, yeah. And I really dislike being labelled crazy um, <laughs> because to me crazy is going to attempt something like this with doing zero work. Um, you know, I've had to tick so many boxes to even get to the start line. Uh, I've had to do courses. Uh, I've built a boat. I've learnt to row. I've put in the hours. I've put in the effort. I do a lot of uh, mental visualisation. I have tried to think of this so realistically. I watch and Google the biggest hurricanes in the Atlantic. And um, that doesn't terrify you? Well, to me, that's my mental prep. If I can't sit there and watch that on a screen, there's no way I can get out there and do it. So I sit there, I look at it, I imagine that's my little boat bobbing around in that ocean. I look at the structure of the waves, the distance between them, um, and I'm constantly just thinking, okay, so that's my boat. Um, what am I going to be doing? How am I going to handle that? My boat's built for this. It's an ocean, it's a purpose built ocean rowing boat. So they're built to self right, self drain. Um, and it's, you know, obviously going to be your mental resilience 
is going to be, I guess, challenged the most. And a lot of the sailors and, and yachties, you know, I've been on display at the boat shows. So high exposure to people that have circumnavigated and done a lot of single-handed crossings. They have always said to me, Michelle, your vessel will never give up. It'll be here. So, um, you know, I, I just think I've got to go and see what the ocean can do. I've got to be aware of it. That's half the thing of anything is, is being um, educated on what's ahead and then mentally preparing. When we talk about firsts, we're talking about when you made this decision, you had never rowed. No, yeah. So um, the fact that I'm not a rower, it sort of was completely insignificant. Uh, and I guess that inspiration was probably fueled by the fact that Roz Savage, you know, the English lass that did it in 05, she had done a little bit of school rowing or university rowing, but you know, it doesn't count. It's not like she was a surf boat rower or anything. Um, so it just made me think, well, she did it, I can do it. <laughs> it didn't matter. I think what's fascinating is the mental preparation, the mental strength that you've spoken about. So when you're looking at the, for example, the hurricane footage, mm -hmm. how do you imagine being at the base of a wave and the size of the wave that you're talking about? Describe mm -hmm. that to us and then the distance. So you would be up and down, up and mm -hmm. down. How do you mentally picture that and prepare for that? Um, well, I love rides. Um, so I've been to you know, all the theme parks in America and there's not one ride that I would not go on. So I tell myself, it's just going to be like being in a theme park, right? And a very long uh, roller coaster ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so in the Atlantic, it's, they're, they're long. The uh, wave action is not like what we see in, you know, on, you know, I go rowing around Sydney Harbour. It's short, sharp, choppy stuff. Whereas in the Atlantic, they're a big distance between. They're big and they're rolling. Um, okay add 30 or 40 knots of breeze that's when you start to get you know maybe four or five foot of white water on top breaking over you i don't know what that's going to be like i can only imagine the sound of that will be horrendously frightening and i anticipate i will be absolutely crapping myself i can imagine myself being strapped down i've got a little velcro strap that last minute decided you know why don't we get this strap so that moments of being locked up in my cabin I can actually take advantage of resting whereas if I didn't have that you're constantly bracing you know um, and you can't you get... sleep if you're bracing I... exactly so I thought I'm gonna have the strap installed so that I can take advantage of you know if I do have to be bunged up in there for any extended period of time and um, yeah so I'll just I don't know, use some um, meditation style techniques as well. So calm my breathing, go through a rational checklist. Is my boat broken? No. Are you broken? No. Uh, is your cabin leaking? No. So, you know, I will go through like a rational checklist. And I've actually even gone to the point of having this in print mm -hmm. because uh, in the lead up to what I've been doing in the last two years, um, I've expressed or experience stress like I never have in my life. So, and moments where I've just drawn complete blanks on things that I know, topics that I know. So for that, it made me think, well, I need a strategy. When I'm out there, if I'm gonna draw a blank, shit, what am I gonna, and you gotta think quick because when stuff goes wrong, it happens fast. So I'm in the middle of just completing my ship's manual where I've written down every system that I have on board and I'm putting a step one watermaker operation step one step two step three and it is an absolute you know follow this no brainer when this is switched off and i'm in panic mode i'm just going to pull that out and go through the list methodically yeah imagine you're in the, the the weather's turned bad you're in the boat you're strapped down it really is then a mental test isn't it as long oh, as the yeah. boat can hold its own mm. it's a mental test for you mm, totally and i've often thought I would love it if you could have a test on your boat, like a stress test, that said your boat has been tested to withstand the forces of, and let's say the maximum force it's ever gonna go through. And I mean, if I had the knowledge that that is never gonna break, it's not gonna crack, I think for me personally, I'd be in there having a great time. I actually would. I love being thrown around. I love being upside down. Um, you know, at training, I would just jump up on the monkey bars and just hang upside down. I love it. 
So I think if you could remove any fear of your vessel's failure, I'd be fine. But unfortunately you can't. So I am gonna have those moments of, um, you know, what if or, um, oh shit. <laughs> and I think that's what would plague you if you were in the boat. It's the what if, what could go wrong? Yeah. How long is it going to last for? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, so, you know, in, uh, I'll quote the 2013 race. They got caught in a massive storm cell and they were all bunged up in their cabins for about 56 hours. They could not get out on the rowing deck. Uh, every single boat in that fleet capsized and except for two. Two boats managed not to capsize. If that happens, if you've put all of this effort in and the boat capsizes because of mother nature, how do you cope with that? <sighs> uh, you mean if you had to mayday? Yeah, I haven't even thought of that. Uh, you know, I heard of uh, four or five boats that aid last year and my heart just sank because, you know, you think of how hard you've worked to get there. You're not going to give up easy. So anyone that does call a mayday, man, they have not given up easy. And um, first and foremost, it's a survival challenge. And yes, I'm not going out there to die. So you do have to, you know, maybe there will come a time when you have to, but I haven't crossed that bridge mentally. I just haven't even considered having a call a mayday. I don't want to go there. Talk me through what, not that there will be an average day, but what a normal day should be while you're in the race. Uh, I intend to row between 14 and 16 hours a day. That's and, punishing. Well, yeah, it is. Um, but I have learned in the past through doing a world record on a Concept2 indoor rowing machine, that's punishing, um, that you are so capable of more than you think you are and um, that you actually do become quite mechanical. So um, I learned over that six day period, I had to row for six days for uh, 14 hours a day to achieve uh, a world record. And you know, by day four, I woke up, I wasn't even sore. So it just proved to me that, wow, your body adapts so quickly, four days. I'm not elite, I'm not an athlete, I'm not a rower, you know? And so there's a lot of comfort for that in me. I know that out there, I will adapt quite quickly. I know that within two weeks, and you know, and this is also something that the uh, race organizers tell us they say that they get unindated in the first two weeks from rowers wanting to get off what was i thinking come and get me and they said we will try and talk you out of that as much as we possibly can we will go through the checklist are you broken are you injured is your boat broken well no so they'll encourage you to stay um, because you're in shock they said the first two weeks is the hardest where you're trying to get used to sleep deprivation you're trying to establish your routine um, you're getting used to life at sea uh, short stunted sleep patterns and um, yeah so it's, it's a whole lot to take on you know in one go and for most of us that do this we've not been in a four or five meter swell you know my my playground at home that I practiced in I couldn't replicate that so it's you know one of those things that you just have to be prepared for when you get there that you're going to struggle for the first you know couple of days maybe two weeks at most, but I, I, I know that I will get comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> Can I ask, are you religious? Uh, I'm not religious, no. Mm. So there'll be no praying out there? No, but I hope that people are praying for me. <laughs> Is that, um, what, what do you call that? <laughs> Do you believe that this journey you found yourself on was inevitable for you, that it's, this is what's meant to be? Yeah, I do. I feel like I'm really honouring my, uh, my purpose and my life path. Like, um, you know, I said to you, I used to struggle with the fact that I couldn't just stay in mundane, Monday to Friday routine, nine to five. So, you know, I lived a life of suppression and repression until finally I've just thought, this is me. You know, I just have to do this sort of stuff. And, and what's next, I have no idea, but I know that I won't just sit comfy for long. I'll do it for a little while, and then I know there'll be something else. What message does it send, do you think, to other women 
young girls or older women to see someone who's in their you know mid to late 40s doing this yeah look I hope and it's as simple as start thinking you can and you will so whatever it is that you've put off man just like grab that bull by the horns tackle it and just do it because it's so fulfilling and I think that's my big learning lesson is you know I said it was suppression and repression I was I felt like I was living in the confines of what is expected bust out get out and just do it now the goal what is the goal? The goal is to finish in 55 days to be the fastest female solo rower in this race. And it will involve me rowing 54 nautical miles per day at an average pace of 2.4 knots per hour. And it will require a minimum of 14 hours on the oars. And I'll be very, very conscious of those numbers. Um, and if I'm in deficit at the end of the 14 hours, it's going to have to be a choice just to stay on the oars and, and, you know, I know to a degree Mother Nature will dictate. And is it realistic? Yes, it is. But it won't give me a day off. I can't have a day off if I want to achieve 55 days. And, you know, in Sydney Harbour, I can sit on 2.8 knots very comfortably if I don't have any wind or current against me. I can do that for three hours at a time very comfortably. I can chat to you while I do it. You know, it's not a sprint. It's a stamina and endurance event. So um, it's doable, but I need a lot of things to go my way. I, I don't need to be fixing things on my boat. I don't need things breaking. And I will have to have Mother Nature, you know, pushing us west. Good luck. Thank we'll you very much. You. Cheers. <laughs> Michelle's now with her boat, the Australian Maid, that's M-A-I-D. Right now, she's in the hustle and bustle of spectators, officials and the world's media. Just a few hours after the race starts, she'll be all alone and might not see another competitor for up to three months. Next week in episode two of A While Away, we talk to the man who will be her eyes and ears on dry land. He's circumnavigated the world so he knows better than most what she's in for. She's rowing a boat, and you mm. row by looking backwards. So you're going to see these big mothers of 24-foot waves heading towards you, and you're thinking, oh, my God. And if they are breaking waves, yes, they can be horrendously... Uh, it will scare you. It can scare you. You think, you know, is my boat going to be able to cope with this? That and more next week. Today's episode of A While Away is produced by Claire Christensen, Ria Abraham and me, Lisa Goddard. Audio mixed by Mark Wright. Recorded on location in Michelle's home country, Australia, and in the studios of Adoni Media. You can find us online at adonimedia.com.au or you can subscribe wherever you normally find your favourite podcasts. Till next week, thanks for listening.